Good morning and welcome to It Takes a Village, Community Providers as Vital Partners with Public Health in the Management of ICE Detainees with Suspected TB Disease webinar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Kelly Masoke, the Director of Education at the Curry Center. We have over 430 participants joining us from across the United States. This webinar is produced by the Curry International Tuberculosis Center, which is part of the University of California, San Francisco, and our center is located in Oakland, California. The Curry Center is one of four TB centers of excellence for training, education, and medical consultation. We cover the western region of the U.S., which is shown in purple on the map. Our region consists of 17 jurisdictions and also includes the U.S. Pacific Island territories. This project was funded by the CDC's cooperative agreement and is part of the University of California, San Francisco. Today's faculty have signed a declaration of disclosure and have indicated that they have nothing to disclose. It's now my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Edith Letterman is with the IHSC Infectious Disease. She's a consultant at the ICE Health Service Corp. Dr. Joseph Garlinghouse is the medical director at Chippewa County, Michigan. Jerry Stafford is the nurse coordinator at the Arizona Tuberculosis Control Program. Dr. Susanna Graves is the chief of the San Diego TB Control and Refugee Health Program. And Dr. Kathleen Mosier is the medical officer with the U.S.-Mexico unit at the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine with the CDC. At this time, I'd like to pass the microphone to Dr. Letterman. Thank you, Kelly, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today to discuss TB management for our detainees in ICE custody and the many, many partners that we have um, which are essential in, in appropriate management. Today we're going to start by discussing um, the incidence of TB disease and the clinical characteristics amongst uh, our ICE detainees. And I'm going to describe a tool that we developed at ICE Health Service Corps to help guide community providers in um, assessing patients that they're seeing with suspected TB and to see whether they're uh, appropriate for a congregate setting. And then we're going to go on to identify key partners who facilitate domestic and transnational continuity of care. That will include two case presentations today, the first one by Dr. Garlinghouse at Chippewa, and the second one is a shared case presentation between um, Ms. Sherry Stafford and Dr. Graves um, between Arizona and, and San Diego. And then we're going to uh, further describe the role and responsibility of each key partners in ensuring safe transition. And um, I'm sorry, I also failed to mention that we're also going to wrap up the presentation, as Kelly mentioned, by um, Dr. Moser discussing the critical role that Cure TB plays at um, providing transnational referrals as well as um, coordinating care should individuals be released to local communities. So I'd like to start out by talking about just the fact that custody is very complicated, even for those of us that work within the custody setting. So it's difficult to determine many factors which are critical in the management of complicated medical patients such as those with suspected or confirmed TB disease, such as whose custody is the individual in, is it federal, state, or local, where is the individual now, which facility are they in, and by the time you identify where they are, have they possibly transferred to another facility or been released, how long will they remain in that custody, and is that custody the final custody prior to release or removal. And finally, when will they be removed or released? And will that release occur in the United States or will that be overseas? Medical care for ICE detainees occurs at either one of two types of facilities, either one that where the medical department is staffed by ICE Health Service Corps or one where there is a custody contract medical service. Regardless of which one, both of these health services reply, excuse me, rely on community resources for specialty referrals as well as hospitalizations. The main factor that may limit their ability to care for patients with suspected tuberculosis is how many respiratory isolation cells they may have in that facility. So when those 
uh, cells are full. Um, we, they rely heavily on community hospitals and the partnership they have with them, as well as the local health departments to further evaluate and manage these patients. Probably the most important thing to consider when you have a patient in custody who either has suspected or confirmed TB is the fact that they're maybe here today but gone tomorrow. And unfortunately, the medical staff are not the ones that may know at first that a patient has been transferred or released. Unfortunately, this leads to delays in communication, which may lead to potentially treatment interruption, failure to isolate a patient who's communicable, and or failure to link to the next care system. So in summary, complex communicable diseases such as TB do require significant coordination to optimize patient outcomes. And in order to have a successful outcome for individuals who are in our custody with suspected or confirmed TB, there are three key areas. The first being prompt screening and action. That would be to identify those that have contagious TB disease, rapidly implement airborne infection isolation, and begin clinical management. Secondly, would be the um, early management and treatment of patients while they're in custody in order to prevent transmission of disease to other detainees and staff, as well as provide appropriate care for the patient. Ultimately, this will provide um, the prevention of transmission to um, those who are in the public, both in the U.S. and foreign communities. And finally, release planning. This relies heavily on established relationships with federal, local, and community partners and requires, as the cases will demonstrate, clear and frequent communication for good outcomes. As far as prompt screening is concerned, CDC provides guidance which requires a symptom screen be performed and one of the following, either a test for infection, which could be a skin test or an IGRA, or a test for TB disease, such as a chest x-ray. And as I'll go on to describe, we feel that the best practice is a chest x-ray. First of all, TB disease incidence is very high amongst our detainees. We looked from the time period of May 1st, 2017 through May 6, 2018 and found that we screened nearly 125,000 individuals who came into our custody by chest x-ray. We had a, a confirmed TB disease rate of nearly 95 per 100,000, which dwarfs that of those that are um, US, you know, U.S. born or non-U.S. born. And this TB disease that we see in our, in, in our uh, patients in custody is unique um, in that most of these patients are asymptomatic. And even though they are asymptomatic, disease may be advanced and communicable. If we look at those individuals who have negative smears, negative NASS, and positive cultures, nearly 90% of them were asymptomatic. And these patients are in the greatest peril because they may not be properly managed. They come in, they're evaluated, they're assessed to have maybe minor findings or chronic findings on a chest x-ray or asymptomatic and then are not further managed and may go on to have, um, to progress to um, uh, more advanced disease and, and spread TB within the congregate setting as well as the community. Even if we look at those who are more advanced, those that are smear positive and known to be communicable, greater than one-third of our patients are asymptomatic. And these individuals would never seek health care if it, and if it weren't for the fact that we were screening them in custody. So the chest x-ray we feel is the best practice because it does provide a rapid and relatively inexpensive way to identify TB disease. And it also provides a point of comparison once a patient has started on treatment. You can see in these chest x-rays two examples here. One of on the left, which is a very classic progressed TB of upper lobe disease, and you can uh, see a cavity here as well. And in the image on the right, this is very minor disease. You can see some uh, blunting of the costophrenic angles as well as some minor nodularity in the hilum. Both of these patients were culture positive. Um, most of our facilities are capable of managing patients with suspected or known TB disease. 
That is, they have the ability to screen, isolate, um, obtain the diagnostics, and start empiric treatment. However, if the capacity for isolation is not there, they will rely on community resources, especially hospitals, to uh, further evaluate patients they identify by x-ray. Hence the crux of this collaborative webinar where we're reaching out to public health partners and community partners alike to hopefully effectively communicate the fact that our detainees have a high incidence of TB disease and that there is a high risk of transmission in the congregate setting. So that we should always maintain a high clinical suspicion despite the patient presenting asymptomatically and with uh, findings which are not classic for tuberculosis. So why do we find that there's a disconnect between the correctional community and the, uh, the, correction, uh, the correctional health care system, I'll say, and the community? Well, I think firstly there's a lack of established relationship and trust between the facilities and the community provider. Um, and the facilities often use the emergency department as their gateway to an admission. Um, I think this is confusing to the emergency department. We send them patients that are asymptomatic with relatively minor findings on their x-ray and they are not used to evaluating patients um, like that. In addition, the emergency departments are high volume areas with, um, and may or may not have isolation areas which are appropriate for a patient with communicable TB. In addition, I think there is a lack of awareness in the community of the high rates of TB disease amongst our detainees, especially asymptomatic disease. And there may be a lack of appreciation for the subtleties and or variations that TB disease may present with on chest x-ray, especially in early TB. Finally, we may have facilities in rural parts of the country where the community providers are not used to seeing TB at all, and TB may be very low on their differential diagnosis. So how can we bridge the gap? Well, we at ICE Health Service Corps encourage our clinical directors and health service administrators to meet with local hospital staff before these cases come up, and to also routinely discuss patients for which they're requesting admission, and possibly think about um, direct admission rather than sending patients to the emergency department. We work with our radiology contract staff to stress reporting the chest x-ray findings only and to not make a diagnosis such as not likely TB, which may mislead providers. We also need to continue to spread the word. That would be publishing literature and sharing information less formally, such as in this webinar today. Our first formal step involved the authoring of a letter to community providers with a toolkit this letter gives background data and rationale for conservative management, including empiric treatment. It provides a point of contact for case consultation and was endorsed by the CDC's TB Centers of Excellence as well as the National TB Controllers Association. And one month after being published, it was adopted by and modified by Bureau of Prisons as they have similar issues with patients that they're managing with suspected TB. So in conclusion, I just wanted to emphasize that TB management and immigrant detention is complicated. It's more conservative than you would see in traditional community approaches and is vitally important for the health of our population both in custody and the surrounding communities. It's impossible to manage these patients appropriately without our many key partners, both in public health and the community. So we thank you for all of your collaboration and we appreciate your time today. And I'm going to pass the mic to our next speaker, Dr. Garlinghouse. Thank you. As she mentioned, I'll be providing the first case. And as that first slide says, I am the medical director of the Chippewa County Health Department. That's what CCHD stands for there. Uh, Chippewa County is in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, so we're up here in the Great White North. Um, and our local sheriff's department and our county jail do play host to ICE detainees. So we had, earlier this year, um, I will just refer to her as uh, patient X, um, she presented to um, the staff at the facility with abdominal pain. And they are treated very well, the ICE detainees, and so they brought her to the emergency department for evaluation. 
and at that time she was felt to have more of a gynecologic issue and so the emergency department did make arrangements for her to see a gynecologist. Now, once that visit did take place, the gynecologist did order a CT scan of the abdomen, which was relatively unremarkable. They did not notice much. However, the radiologist did make note of some abnormality at the bases of the lungs. And so there was an overreading that was to be performed by our local pulmonologist. And once the pulmonologist saw the abnormality at the bases of the lungs, he proceeded to order chest x-rays. Those chest x-rays were read as abnormal. And he suggested to the local health department that we obtain um, tuberculin skin testing on this young lady. Well, her PPD measured nine millimeters of induration. So now we have a young lady, an ICE detainee, with abnormal chest x-ray, positive PPD, and where do we go from here? So as was mentioned in the previous, in the previous talk, chest x-ray is very important for this clinical diagnosis. And it was lended credence by that PPD, we did go one step further. We did order a quantifieron gold, um, which was not going to be stopping our treatment for a presumptive active tuberculosis. But then, lo and behold, the quantifieron gold did come back positive. So our first roadblock being a small community we're dealing with this presumptively active tuberculosis, knowing that we have to treat it. In order to treat a active tuberculosis, it is best to obtain the sputum for both microscopy and for culture before the initiation of the treatment, which should be performed under reverse airflow isolation. So that was our plan. We made arrangements with the local hospital, I made a phone call over to our local emergency department simply to find out who the hospitalist was that was on call that day so that I may speak with him or her directly to see if we could do a direct admission, um, have them put in the orders so that we could obtain the sputum. Instead, later on that day, I received a call from the nursing supervisor, so not the hospitalist. Uh, but from the nursing supervisor, who is the bed control individual, that we could not have the patient admitted. And she said that she was relaying the message both from administration and from the hospitalist, that the hospitalist was uncomfortable admitting a tuberculosis patient, as the pulmonologist, who I mentioned earlier, was away on vacation. Our infectious disease doctor was away on vacation and he was not comfortable admitting a tuberculosis patient. He was not comfortable writing the orders for sputum collection. He was not comfortable writing orders for any treatment. And the administration of the hospital uh, backed up the decision of the hospitalist. Now, coming from a private practice background, I've used that same reverse airflow isolation room in that same hospital in the past. I've ordered sputum induction. I've administered medications. I've worn the N95 mask. I've used universal precautions. So I, I simply found this odd. So the next step was, where do we go from here if we cannot get this sputum in order to start treatment? to determine if this individual does have a multi-drug resistant form of tuberculosis. So the meeting involved our local health department, which is our health officer, the medical director is myself, the, um, the public health nurse, uh, plus law enforcement was there, the county sheriff, um, those individuals who worked at the county jail, the county jail nurse, 
the local hospital sent representation um, in the form of the administration, um, two representatives of administration, in fact, and the nursing supervisor. And then on conference call, we also had the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and the ICE tuberculosis specialist on conference call. So, um, and at that time, the, uh, the letter that was mentioned earlier to community providers that was included in the toolkit, that was also provided again to the hospital. So we had a lengthy meeting, and the hospital still refused to admit the patient for the reverse airflow isolation room. So being the small town that we are, the deputy at the county jail simply obtained the three sputum samples using albuterol inhalers for induction. Once we had the sputum samples, and we're able to send those off to the state lab. Then we were able to initiate treatment using directly observed therapy uh, to be performed by the county jail or the ICE detainee nurse. The medical order consisted of the isoniazid, the rifampin, the pyrazinamide, and a thambutol, uh, with the plan on the initiation of the treatment being for two months with sputums being collected at both one and two months and repeating the chest x-ray at two months. In addition to that, we were going to have all employees at the jail, all hospital contacts, all inmates that this individual had contact with, everyone was to have a PPD placement. And then following up with our plan, the orders for the chest x-ray and the acid fast bacilli sputums were faxed to the jail. Well, we've already had our first roadblock. Here's our second roadblock. So as I mentioned, our plan was to collect that sputum for the AFB and the culture to assess the treatment under the reverse airflow isolation thinking that the letter to community providers that was included in the toolkit and provided to them during the meeting would allow the hospital to allow us to get the patient in there and get the sputum that was necessary. However, the local hospital continued to refuse the collection in the negative pressure room. And at this point, the uh, local infectious disease doctor was back from vacation. And both him and I did speak with administration to no avail. So his opinion, um, well, if she can't provide a sputum sample without it being induced, it's fine. We'll just de-escalate her antibiotics at two months. Empirically, she never coughed that much anyway. Well. Bad things come in threes. So the third roadblock. Everybody remember the abdominal pain that started the whole process? Well, she ended up back in the local hospital emergency department. And this time, instead of going to the local gynecologist, she was transfer transferred to Henry Ford Health System in late June. That is all well and good. However, neither the county jail nor the local hospital reported her emergency department visit or her transfer to, the Hen to Henry Ford to the local health department. Potentially, this could have resulted in incomplete treatment, becoming lost to follow up, et cetera. So, Resolutions and lessons. She did receive treatment in our town to a certain extent. She was eventually tracked down in Detroit. She did continue treatment. So there, there was resolution of this whole scenario. Lessons learned. Community teamwork is absolutely necessary. Community resources have to be known to all those involved. 
communication is key. As mentioned before, delays can lead to treatment interruption. If there's failure to isolate, the, the list goes on and on. The letter to community providers, um, spelling out the responsibilities of those key players in the community. Everyone needs to know their role and to be able to um, assume their role and to communicate with all the other providers involved in the care of this individual. So that ends my presentation of case number one. I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to Sherry. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to share with you a snapshot in time to give you an example of how it really does take a village to coordinate care of TB patients in a correctional setting. So I'm Sherry Stafford, and I'm the TB nurse coordinator for the state of Arizona. Um, so since I'm coming from the state perspective, I'm kind of going to give you the 10,000 foot view. First, I want to give you a quick caveat. This is an example, and it doesn't reflect um, all correctional cases in Arizona. We actually have about 20 to 25 percent of our TB cases diagnosed in a correctional facility, usually on intake. In different places, we'll do it slightly different. Um, but in the next five minutes, I'll be share, showing you how this one particular instance was coordinated. Um, in the interest of time, I'll be simplifying and generalizing to show you the big picture. And before I start, I wanted to give a big thank you to our partners in the county health department, the correctional facility, and the hospital who provided the care for these patients. Okay, so our story starts in Yuma County. And so Yuma County is in the corner of Arizona that borders California and Mexico. It has about 200,000 people in the land area roughly the same size as Connecticut. So if any of you have visited Arizona, say, to go to the Grand Canyon, you've probably driven through and realized how vast our space is and how uh, few people there are outside of the greater Phoenix area. So that kind of gives you an idea, like Yuma County, you know, there's people there. It's not our smallest county, but it's not Phoenix. It's, it's, it's fairly small. Um, so it begins at a privately run correctional facility. And this facility houses ICE patients, um, ICE inmates, among others, typically for less than two weeks. So on a given day, they might have between 50 to 100 ICE detainees. So ICE um, is responsible for the custody and has the authority to say where they are housed and when they will be released from custody, while the facility houses them and is responsible for direct patient care. So they're responsible for doing the intake screening um, so what they do is they check um, you know, for signs and symptoms, and then they also uh, do a skin test. Um, they don't do the quantiferin or another IGRA, but that would be an option at other facilities. So if they test positive, they then have an agreement with the hospital to do the chest x-ray. So it's basically being done on an outpatient basis, um, and the, the hospital does the x-rays and then sends them the report. If there's something abnormal with the report, that's when they are then put into airborne isolation at the correctional facility. And the correctional facility collects three sputums, and they ship the sputums, not the patient, to the hospital lab. Again, they have an agreement with the hospital, and the hospital lab um, performs two NAAs on, well, on two of the specimens. Um, so on one particular day, it was a Monday, I remember that, uh, Monday in June, we had three results, and these are the results. So you can imagine this is not a normal day for us. Um, so we had three inmates, all were smear negative times three. Expert detected MTB on all three. Um, on the first inmate, probe E, mutation was detected. On the second inmate, probe A and B was detected. And on the third, there was no uh, mutation noted, but they were from the same um, country of origin as the first patient. So what happened? Well, of course, the hospital lab is like, uh, I have to report this. They report it right away to the correctional facility. And then they report it right away to the local health department. Um, the local health department, that's when they called us and said, hey, we have a problem. And then we worked together to get further testing on those three samples. Um, so our goal was to send it off to CDC for MDDR to find out what mutations were detected 
and if they confer resistance. Because uh, it was uh, two possible MDR cases, um, we also coordinated with ICE here at the state level, you know, just to give them a heads up. Um, and then the facility, you know, coordinates with the local health department and ICE. So basically we're all communicating and all coordinating together. Unfortunately, because they were smear negative, there was insufficient quantity of the bacteria in the samples for the MDDR to actually have a result. So this is what came back. It said that no amplification was detected, so we had to wait for it to grow, and then we sent it off again for MDDR, and I will be sharing you the results of that. But that took about three and a half weeks to have growth, um, so we were basically playing a waiting game. None of them were symptomatic. Um, so no, medica no medications were started. In the meantime, it's all about communication and coordination. Um, so we all communicated via phone, via email. It gets a little bit tricky via email because we can't use patient identifiers. And two of them were from the same country of origin, so that makes it a little bit tricky when you're doing it. Um, you're saying the patient from this country, and there's two from the same country. So it made it a little bit complicated that way. Um, but we all coordinated together, and ICE decided to that um, they should go to a facility that has a higher level of medical management, and that facility happens to be in San Diego. Um, so we made sure that we also coordinated with the health department in San Diego and gave them information. Um, I talk about my job kind of being about stalking people sometimes because Unlike you know, a correctional facility or a private provider, in public health, um, we want to make sure that we know where the patients are and that they are coordinated, that they are connected with public health regardless of which jurisdiction it is. So even when they leave our jurisdiction, they still haven't left our responsibility um, because our job is to make sure that they aren't lost to care. One way that we do that is that uh, we try to make sure that we get the A number and the country of birth and then we can use ICE online um, inmate detainee locator system, and that will kind of show us while they're in custody where they're at. So I do that periodically, like I might have people that I'm stalking, and I just like type in the number, country of birth, and then I can check on a monthly basis where they're at. So this is what eventually came back. Um, probe A and B mutation, unfortunately, it looks like there's going to be resistance to all four first-line drugs, and that is what came out. Um, this is the result. Luckily, second-line drugs looked okay. And then the one with probe E mutation, um, there was also a mutation for the fluoroquinolones, unfortunately, in addition to the four first-line drugs. And this is what eventually grew out on the DSTs. You can see that there were some second-line drugs there was resistance to, um, but there were still some options available, luckily. And then the final one, the one I don't want to forget, uh, they had no mutations and there was no resistance noted. Um, so I am now going to pass it over to um, our colleagues over at San Diego. Hi, this is Susanna Graves from County of San Diego TV Control. So it was very helpful that Dr. Letterman alerted us to these cases immediately um, at least as soon as she knew that they were likely to come to the facility in San Diego County. And so we knew about these patients even before they were in our jurisdiction and were able to communicate directly with Arizona about, you know, the workup that was being done. And I suppose if we had wanted anything that they weren't already doing, we, we could have asked for it at that point. And then additional workup once they arrived, because they got here, I think they started arriving about two days after we heard about them. So we got an email from Dr. Letterman that there were two cases of TB in custody with RPOB mutations on gene expert, um, and a third case without an RPOB mutation. And um, the, the testing and results were communicated directly to us by Arizona. So we had that direct link with Arizona, but but Dr. Letterman was also linked in so that we could all stay on the same page um, because there was a lot of information going back and forth uh, in a, with a pretty rapid uh, turnaround. And um, she let us know that there was a plan to transfer them to the facility here, I think because they have isolation rooms in San Diego and um, 
they don't have that capacity in their detention facility in Arizona. Um, but maybe she could correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then prepare for their potential eventual release, which um, could be in San Diego County. So um, initially, when they arrived in San Diego, um, the first two patients, which had RPOB mutations, were um, treatment was deferred for them because both were clini not clinically ill at all. They were asymptomatic and identified on the screening that Dr. Letterman described earlier. And molecular testing for those samples was still pending. Both were smear negative. Um, and so the initial uh, molecular testing um, took a little while to come back. So. Um, the second patient also had abnormal LFTs on baseline screening. So we, we started getting baseline testing in preparation for starting them on therapy. And the second pa patient, patient number two, had abnormal LFTs and um, chronic hepatitis B. So that patient, while we, while we were waiting for the molecular uh, sensitivities to come back, um, was started on tenofovir to get prepared to start on treatment. And the third patient who had no mutations was started on TB therapy. Um, when the MDDR results became available from the cultures for patient one and two, we found that one of them was MDR and one of them was actually pre-XDR with um, resistance mutations that, uh, um, that were just reviewed. Um, and uh, those results were sent directly to us from Arizona. Um, again, with ice in the loop so that we were all on the same page. Um, we also reached out to our state health department because we have a state MDR consultation service um, that we generally engage in complex MDR cases. And both of these qualified since one had hep B as a complicating factor and the other had pre-XDR-TB. Patient one was started on a pre-XDR regimen of bedaquilin, linazolid, cyclosterine, amikacin, and initially augmentin because um, we were in the process of, uh, we started, or I should say, Dr. Letterman started the process of procuring clofazamine and we, um, we sort of took over that role when that patient came out. Um, and patient two was started on Levaquin, which was changed to moxifloxacin, linazolid, cyclosterine, amikacin, and bedaquilin. So I think that sort of um, pointing out some of the roles in this care coordination and things that were, I think, nicely shared between us and our colleagues at ICE were um, that, you know, we were able, because we had the heads up early, we were able to check in with our pharmacy and confirm which of the medications those patients on we had in supply, um, which isn't usually an issue for tea, um, garden variety sensitive TB, but for these MDR cases can be a challenge, particularly with bedacol, and it's not one that, that we have that our pharmacy dispenses. We have to get it from an outside pharmacy. And, and um, so we were able to check, you know, how much supply we had of various medications and how long it would take our pharmacy to get them in stock. Um, then on the ICE side, um, they were able to provide both patients with uh, a long supply of bedaquilin, which allowed us to get our supplier uh, to provide refills. Um, we also were able to review all the treatment records from ICE uh, as well as several ER visits that happened related to medication side effects once the patients were started on TB treatment. Um, we prepared two units in our local infectious housing program, and we coordinated with ICE to meet each patient for a warm handoff um, and transport to the infectious housing so we didn't have a situation where the patients were dropped off somewhere and not, not knowing where to go and end up exposing the public. Um, from the ICE side of things, they sent all of the treatment records from within ICE as well as those ER visits, and we'd already gotten the medical records from Arizona in that initial um, discussion. And um, as I mentioned, um, they helped out with the medication supply, so 
um, since it had already been dispensed to the patient, they were able to provide the patient with a five-week supply, each patient with a five-week supply of vidaclin, and the initial steps of the clofazamine um, single patient IND process were initiated um, using our California State Department of Public Health IRB for that protocol. So since the State Department of Health was already engaged, um, they knew about the patients and, and we were able to um, utilize that IRB to get clofazamine. It did take um, several, like about two weeks after their release to obtain a supply of clofazamine, um, but now they're on it. Yeah, so I mean, th those were sort of uh, just to highlight the, the, the care coordination between us ICE in Arizona, and, and I think this, this is kind of a story of how it can work well. Um, um, one of these patients is actually transferred out, is no longer infectious and transferred out of our jurisdiction, is now in Florida. The other one remains infectious and is in our isolation housing still. Um, but I'll turn it over to Dr. Moser to talk about CARE-TB and the transnational referral program. So um, I was asked to speak about the role that CURE-TB has um, as part of this village in assuring continuity of care for TB patients in ICE custody. CURE-TB's main program goal is to assist in assuring continuity of care for TB patients when they leave the U.S. or what many other countries call transfers out. And for 2015, the last complete year of data based on reports from U.S. TB programs 375, or 4% of total counted U.S. TB cases left the U.S. prior to treatment completion. So these are the patients that Cure TB works with, both from health departments and from our correctional partners, including ICE, to assist in continuity of care. Cure TB began back in the late 90s within the San Diego County TB program um, to secure ongoing treatment for patients traveling primarily between the U.S. and Mexico. The program evolved over time, and in 2016, what we might call the hub of Cure TB operations moved to the CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine. Um, but we retain a very formal MOU-based partnership with the San Diego County TB program and their Cure TB units. Also importantly, Cure TB now routinely works with countries across the globe as needed um, to link patients to care. In 2017, Cure TB and um, ICE entered into a formal agreement to assist their detained patients with TB with their continuity of care um, matters. Now, for patients in immigration custody, Cure TB's work is to link patients with active TB to care, and these patients fall into different categories at the time we encounter them. Some are laboratory confirmed which are the easiest to refer to other countries since the diagnosis is generally clear and all countries see them as a priority. In these cases, our work is to collect relevant clinical information and source diagnostic documents whenever we can to transfer to the receiving countries. They really do like to see the source susceptibility results, et cetera, just as you would like to as a program. We also work with clinically proven cases, often less of a priority in other countries who are used to diagnosing by smear. And our challenge with these patients often is to get the relevant um, radiographic evidence for the clinical diagnosis. And finally, there are individuals who leave the U.S. prior to having a second radiographic study and prior to having final laboratory results. And our goal here is to continue to collect all pending results when final and to inform um, uh, the downstream providers in our receiving countries when we, were, when we um, obtain those results. Now, to enhance continuity of care, Cure TB must get relevant and accurate clinical information, but also as important is to connect directly with the patient since sending just the clinical information to the receiving countries is not sufficient to secure follow-up care. 
it's of great importance, of course, that the patient is motivated to attend the follow-up care once they arrive back to their home country. So the Cure TB process is, as you see here, it's to receive the notification. In this case, we get it from the ICE, ICE Health Services Corps staff. Then we have a telephone conversation with each and every patient to develop a rapport with that patient to explain Cure TB's role, to educate them about their TB diagnosis um, or their workup, which is often still in progress and confusing to them, and to explain what should um, happen if and when they are deported. We also collect information from them so we can connect with them if and when they're deported, and we let them know how to reach us once they're outside the US. Then, once we learn of their departure from the US, we notify the receiving country and over time um, collect the final treatment outcomes and feed those treatment outcomes back to the jurisdiction where that correctional facility was located. Now, sometimes we need to connect with the receiving countries in anticipation of patient movement. For example, with MDR patients, this can be important since some countries have a long process to get second-line drugs. It's also important to do pre-planning for patients on non-standard first-line regimens. For example, some countries do not have access to rifibutin. Others have difficulty getting individual first-line drugs because they use almost exclusively combination formulations. So for these patients, it's important for us to be able to inform the receiving countries as to why the patient is on a modified regimen so they can make deformed, uh, informed decisions as to the best regimen to use once that patient arrives. We don't prescribe what they should do, but they, we inform them so they can decide their best options. And sometimes it takes Cure TB, it takes us a bit of time and investigation to get a the details of the clinical picture, especially when, as some of these cases show, the patient has been in different facilities and hospitals during their treatment course in the US. To the last point, it has been very valuable for CureTB to have regular monthly meetings with the ICE Health Services Core team, where we review specific patients to assure that there's clarity and, and completeness of information. And then finally, Cure TB plays a role, but a smaller role, if the patient is released in the US. In general, once we know that a patient will have a US disposition, we contact the TB program in the jurisdiction of that detention facility so they can take whatever interjurisdictional or if the person's in their own jurisdiction and will stay there, they can take whatever follow-up actions are required Sometimes they have all the patient information already because they've followed right along um, with us. Sometimes they, we have more information than they do, and certainly we supply that. Once in a while, depending on the circumstance, we may be the ones to notify the follow-up jurisdiction if that individual released in the US is actually going somewhere else. So we work with the health departments um, on that. Um, here is the contact information for U.S. health departments to use to get in contact with QTB. And you'll notice that California programs are asked to contact San Diego County TB program. Um, QTB staff, while non-California jurisdictions are directed to DGMQ QTB staff. But whoever you contact, uh, we know where each other are and we'll get you to the right people. And finally, I just wanted to acknowledge the people who work day to day um, to make the Cure TB program um, work so effectively. And uh, thank you for your attention. Wonderful, thank you. Um, that concludes all of our presentations for today's webinar. So I'd like to thank uh, each of the presenters. And we're now going to move into the question and answer period. We have about seven minutes remaining. Um, I would like to quickly mention that many of the resources that were mentioned today during the webinar um, are also posted online in the materials folder. Um, and I've moved the chat screen over. Uh, it's active again. If people would like to type text questions in, you're very welcome to. Another option is to ask your question over the phone. 
So you, if you'd like to ask a phone question, we'll start with those. You would press on your phone star six to unmute, and then you can go ahead and ask your question. So we'll pause for a moment to see if any phone questions come in. I'd also like to mention that we do have Dr. Diana Elson um, joining us as well as a panelist for the Q&A period. Dr. Elson is the chief at the Public Health Safety and Preparedness Unit, um, which includes ICE, ICE Health Service Court. Okay, I'll pause again. If there's any phone questions, please dial star six on your phone and then go ahead and ask your question. I do see a few questions coming in in the chat. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and proceed with the chat questions. All right, so the first question is, what is the reason TSTs are used versus IGRAs with foreign-born detainees? Would any of our speakers like to address that? Hi, this is Sherry. Um, so it has to do with resources, and it's a decision based upon the facility about which one they're going to be using. Um, we know that the IGRAs are great for foreign-born, um, but it depends upon the local resources and the logistics. And logistically, it can be a challenge, particularly when you're in a remote location. Thank you. If, if any of the other presenters would like to comment on that, you're welcome to. This is Edie Letterman. I, I agree completely with Sherry. All right, thank you. So our next question says, one presenter talked about an ICE online locator. Is this something that health departments can access? Sherry, would you like to address that? Uh, yes. Uh, so I think you, uh, usually I just Google ICE locator and it pops up. Um, and anybody can um, can go to it. Oh, yeah, and it's on my slide, too. Like on my slide, I have the, the web address. And you can just go to that. Anybody can access it. It really helps if you have the A number and the country of birth because um, spelling of names sometimes is slightly different. And then it also gets confusing when there's two last names because you don't know if, it's, if, if they're run together or if they're just using one of them or the other. So the A number is key. And we always try to get that from our correctional facilities. And if we do a transfer to someplace else, we write down the A number and the country of birth. Great, thank you. Okay, our next question. When an ICE detainee is released from custody into the US, are they always released to the county the ICE facility is in? Uh, Dr. Elson, would you like to address that? Usually, um, detainees are released uh, at the gate of the facility, so essentially they are released from where they are. Um, they're, they're with uh, family units. They're, um, there are a few family residential centers. Um, they may be handled a little differently, um, but usually um, they're, yeah, they're not, you know, there could be some exceptions, but in most cases, they are released from the facility, and then the um, detainees will make their own arrangements to go to their intended destination. So they're not required to stay, um, you know, in the same jurisdiction. Um, they, you know, it, they they can go. You know, they usually indicate an address where they intend to go. Um, but they will uh, have use their own resources or family resources to get themselves there. Hi, this is Sherry. Um, so what we oftentimes see is that uh, where they're released from, the facility that they're released from, they usually don't stay in that county. Um, they usually end up going elsewhere. Um, they might go to another county in, Ari in the state of Arizona, or they might leave to a completely different state. Um, and usually they're, like, ICE will usually have the information about where they're intending to go. And Cure TV is a great resource for that, too, because um, they, they may also have the information, and sometimes the patient will actually reach out to Cure TV and tell them where they're at. 
and that really helps too. So it's kind of all just coordinating with your with your partners and um, seeing if you can get an address and a phone number. Um, sometimes they're never located. Um, sometimes they are. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. All right. Um, I think we can take one final question and. Then we'll go ahead and conclude here. The, in the cases presented, the patients were asymptomatic and smear negative culture positive. Why would they still be considered infectious? And one of our presenters like to take that. But is the question from the standpoint of a contact investigation? Um, looks like she's typing to clarify, yes. yes. Okay. Um, so, and Diana, you may want to add on to this, but usually from our standpoint, we take we allow the local health department to take the lead on contact investigations and as far as what they are considering um, to look for. Um, in my experience, if the patient's isolate is sensitive and they're um, smear negative, no, they there would not be a contact investigation. They wouldn't be considered infectious at that time. One of the reasons we were emphasizing those cases in this presentation was that, you know, that is a picture at a point in time and, and the disease is not static. And so if we miss that opportunity where the individual is smear negative now to start treatment and then we call them back and a month later when they're culture positive, they may have progressed to smear positive disease. Um, there certainly are times where we encounter drug resistant isolates where um, jurisdictions will have a higher standard of you know, uh, what they will and won't, won't conduct as far as a contact investigation. Great. Thank you very much um, to, again, all of our presenters and our participants today. Um, it is on the one hour mark now, so this is going to conclude our webinar. All right. Thank you and goodbye.